Good evening, everybody. Welcome to uh, the second in our series of the Gospels. This is the Gospel according to St. Matthew. And uh, Matthew's a really interesting uh, Gospel text. And um, the ending of Matthew, which we'll get to at the end of this um, of this class, is really one of my favorite parts of the Bible. And actually, I, I would love to see if there's a way that we could work, if the church could work in the end of Matthew into some sort of a liturgy so that we use it on a regular basis because I think um, the Great Commission at the end of Matthew is uh, uh, perhaps one of the most important sayings of Jesus that we need to remember every single day. So we'll get to that at the end. But so who wrote Matthew? It was Matthew, the apostle. Um, so it's most likely that the Apostle Matthew wrote it. This evidence comes from Papias' account coming through Eusebius. Uh, and it says that Matthew collected the oracles in the Hebrew language and each interpreted them as best he could. Um, there may have been more than one gospel in Aramaic or Hebrew known to the early church. And it was referred to as a collection of Jesus' sayings that Matthew collected and others used to write the gospel. Now, we're getting into something really interesting here where... Remember I said in the Mark class that most scholars believe Mark to be the first, and then Matthew, and then Luke, and then John. And so we're going to get into the date in a second here. But I think, and we'll get into this a little bit again, I'll just say it now. I think there's a possibility that Matthew as an a biography of Jesus as a complete work, a literary work, doesn't exist until after Mark's account. However, I also think it's distinctly possible that Matthew had a collection of the teachings and uh, an account of what was happening in uh, Jesus' life. And that it's possible that those collections were used by Matthew, Mark, and Luke to create the three synoptic gospels, where maybe you had Matthew as um, uh, the secretary of the group of disciples, where he was actually keeping track of all that was going on. And so you have a source that is authored by Matthew that's not a complete literary source yet, and that Mark uses, and then Matthew uses, and so on, before Matthew creates the literary function. Um, we can't know for sure. We cannot know for sure which one's first, um, Matthew or Mark. We do know that there's a lot of shared material in all four gospel accounts, especially in the three synoptic accounts. And there are different emphases on each, given when they were written, who they were written to, who wrote them. Um, think about it this way. If you were to talk about... Um, Church of the Redeemer, and why it's important to you, why you love your church, whatever church you go to, it doesn't have to be Redeemer. If you were to talk about why it's important to you, um, and you wrote a story about why it's important, a true story about what the church is, how the church is important, and four other people in your church wrote a story about why it's important to them, there's a lot of things that would match, and there's a lot of things that wouldn't match exactly because you have different perspectives. Take it out of the church context. If you wrote a story about why you love the city you live in, whatever city it is, and 20 other people wrote the same story, why, do I, why I love my city, you'd have a lot of similarities, but you'd also have a lot of variant, a lot of difference. One of the beautiful things about the Gospels is that there are variants. It makes them more authentic. If everything was perfect and everything lined up perfectly, it would, it would be a fix. The fact that we're allowed to have nuance and variations in our holy books lends enormous credibility that they are true and real and that the original intent of the book is there. And so... We believe that Matthew is the author of the gospel according to Matthew. And so if we assume that the um, narrative Matthew relies on Mark, and Mark was most likely written in the mid-60s, 
Matthew must be written after the mid-60s as a narrative piece. Um, many give Matthew dates ranging from the year 70 to the year 95 AD. I see that as two possibilities. Um, Matthew is written soon after the year 70 because many feel that it references, it references strongly the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70. Um, the parable of the wedding feast in Matthew 22 is given by some as evidence. Um, however, the language in the parable is, uh, as described by Donald Hagner, um, hyperbolic and not necessarily to be taken literally. And several scholars have indicated the possibility that the language is a conventional stereotype for punitive um, expeditions. So you can't just take that parable and say it must be just after 70. Right? There's other evidence there. Okay. Um, another one, Matthew 24, uh, 15 to 20. I'll read that to you. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. And so um, a lot of them will use this to show that this is a post-70 date, um, that the... Um, and that, that that saying is referring to the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, but it can, this could also be explained as a prophecy from Jesus, where Jesus was prophesying the, the fall of Jerusalem that would happen. Um, and so even though Matthew's narrative gospel relies on Mark, it does not mean that it had to be written more than 10 years later. It could have been just a few years. So when is Matthew's narrative written? After Mark's. Definitely before the year 80. How do we know it's definitely before the year 80? Um, Matthew is used by uh, Ignatius and the Didache extensively. You see an enormous amount of the gospel according to St. Matthew in the writing of Ignatius and in the Didache. And so uh, you could date it late 60s to 80 at the latest. So we'll give you a range. I imagine it was probably written just after the fall of Jerusalem or just before the fall of Jerusalem. Um, we continue. Where was Matthew written from? There's several uh, possibilities. The Transjordan area, um, although evidence for this is not really very strong. Um, according to Donald Hagner, there are too many other possibilities that explain why um, terms in Matthew like beyond the Jordan are used. Um, Tyre or Sidon or Alexandria have also been suggested, but also it's not very likely that that's where Matthew is written from. Um, an opinion was held for a long time because of Papias, uh, Papias' claims on Matthew that it was written in Jerusalem. The Jewish characteristics of Matthew also add credence to this theory. Um, however, the most likely place that Matthew is written from, according to scholarship, is Antioch. Evidence is that Antioch had a very large Jewish population. It had Greek language use and an early Christian presence. Further evidence, as I mentioned before, is the link of Matthew to the Didache and Ignatius, the bishop of Antioch. Also, many of the issues Matthew deals with in his gospel account, um, like, like Jewish Christians defending themselves to other Jewish people and relating to the Gentiles, would have been very commonplace in Antioch. So our best guess of where it was written to was Antioch. What's the purpose of Matthew's gospel? Of course, the purpose is to t teach people about Jesus, but uh, why did he find it necessary to write the narrative in his time? Uh, there's, a, again, very, there's a lot of uh, reasons, and it doesn't mean that one is right or one is wrong, uh, and we'll talk about that. Um, Matthew may be a theological interpretation of Mark, given that it is a retelling of Mark's account with special interests and emphases. That's interesting. It could be maybe a um, uh, that it's it's just a retelling of what Mark told with more with more in it. It is much longer. Some say that uh, Matthew is a lectionary that coincides with the Jewish festival year and it provides many liturgical readings. 
Uh, it's held that it, it's a catechetical or a teaching book, a textbook used to teach people about Christianity. Um, really strong evidence of this because there's very long teaching discourse, discourses by Jesus throughout Matthew's account. Um, it's, a, it's possible that it was written to correct the early church to help with the problems in the community like the vision and false prophets. I think three and four are really strongly connected here, that it's a catechetical handbook and that it's written to um, correct early church problems, especially the vision amongst the people and false prophets, things that still haunt the church today. Um, and it's a book written in contrast to the interpretation um, that reveals the truth of the Old Testament and the Torah. So all these points have truth to them. Um, Matthew is a community book. It's written with to meet the immediate needs of a particular community and readership. Um, the author wants the readers to understand that the new faith, Christianity, the way, Jesus followers, um, to be in continuity with the faith of their ancestors. It's a big reason why Matthew starts off the books of, uh, of the New Testament, why it's the first one. Matthew did a great job. He succeeded in showing that the new way, the way of a Christ follower, is a continuation of the way of the Old Testament. So we move on to the uh, an outline of, uh, of Matthew, which it really could be three major parts, uh, major blocks in Matthew. The first being, who is Jesus and his connection to the Old Testament? That's chapter 1. Uh, through chapter 4, um, 16. So who is Jesus and how is he connected to the Old Testament is the first section. The second section is Jesus is the Messiah. Um, this is marked by Jesus' announcement of the kingdom to Israel and the response from Israel. Okay, so that is, um, G that, that, that's basically Matthew 4, chapter 4, verse 17 to chapter 16, 20 major events in that section, Jesus calling his first disciples, Jesus ministers in Galilee and teaches in synagogues, um, the Sermon on the Mount, really important, um, Jesus performing miracles, Jesus calling Matthew, um, and, and, and then you have miracles and teaching and miracles and teaching and miracles, remember those long teaching discourse. The third section of Matthew's account, the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus, chapter 16, verse 21 through chapter 28, 20, the end. Um, the kingdom is enacted through the death and resurrection of Jesus. So he foreshadows his death, transfiguration, and then he foreshadows his death again. He teaches, he foreshadows his death a third time, he performs miracle, and he enters Jerusalem. And of course, everything flows from there. We know what happens. Um, and so what are the thematic themes, the important themes, what are the theological emphases in Matthew? And there's three major ones. The first, the kingdom of God. Well, Matthew uses the term kingdom of heaven. These terms are synonymous. The author portrays this by showing Jesus as a fulfillment of scripture and that Gentiles are included in the kingdom. And that while God's kingdom is present, the perfect fulfillment of the kingdom is yet to come. And we have a mission to accomplish as we wait. The second theme, who is Jesus? Jesus is the Messiah in David's line. Using the term often son of David, Jesus redefines the Messiah as he foreshadows his death and his passion. The account also, Matthew also shows that the Messiah is not just a Messiah for Israel, but for the whole world. Also important is the emphasis that Jesus is, this is the God of Israel. Okay, and so we can see uh, in Matthew 3.3, 3, which I'll get to really quick here. <clears throat> Oh, when John the Baptist is preparing the way and it's citing 
Isaiah 40, uh, verse 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the ways of the Lord, make his paths straight. Right? So, um, you're making a strong connection. Matthew's making a strong connection here to the God of the Old Testament. And finally, and this is the really important one for us to listen to. I mean, this is all important, but this is really important for us to listen to. Um, the community of disciples. What is the community of disciples? Uh, what does that mean when I say the community of disciples? Well, um, it's pretty simple. That's the church. We are all disciples of Jesus. Each of us are disciples of Jesus. What are we to do as a community? Matthew's account has many imperatives for how to live in community coming right from Jesus. If one is to trust to be in allegiance with Jesus, one must follow the guidelines Jesus puts forth in his many teachings. Think the Beatitudes. Think all the teaching discourses in Matthew. Think all the parables in Matthew. They're directed to each one of us. Um, but it's this theme that we have to live like Jesus tells us to. The highest call in Matthew is the Great Commission. Now, when the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, and when they saw, they worshipped him, but some doubted, and Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. It'd be a great way to end the liturgy, wouldn't it? What if every time you worshiped God, whether it's the daily office, whether it's your own personal prayers, whether it's the Eucharist, and at the end of the Eucharist, you were reminded, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. Go therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that Jesus has commanded you. And behold, Jesus is with you always to the end of the age. I talked about this a little bit in Mark, that our job as Christians is to be kingdom bearers, to bring the kingdom to everyone we meet. And the Great Commission in Matthew defines that. We are to make disciples of everyone we meet. And the way we do that is by baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And we need to teach them to observe what Jesus has commanded us to observe. Servant leadership, loving our neighbor, understanding that we turn to God for forgiveness and that we must forgive others and have faith that Jesus is with each one of us through the power of the Holy Spirit always to the end of the age. Um, Matthew's account is incredible. Uh, I love the parables in Matthew's account. I love preaching the parables in Matthew's account. And a little bit of a teaser, uh, November 14th, Saturday, November 14th, we're having an all-day session with the Dean of Neshota House, my, um, my New Testament professor, Dr. Garwood Anderson, is going to do a four-part series with us at Redeemer on Saturday on the, um, on the parables in Matthew, uh, the parables of Jesus in Matthew. And so it's really exciting to have him here. And one of the things that um, Dr. Anderson implored us was when you read the Great Commission in Matthew, one of the things you should want to do is go back and reread Matthew all over again with the Great Commission in your head. And so I think if you remember every time you hear a sermon, every time you read scripture, every time uh, you do a Bible study with friends, that your job is to make disciples of all nations, to baptize 
to, to bring people to the church to be baptized and to help people observe all that Christ has commanded you. That informs the way you read scripture every time you read it. And that informs what you get out of it. I hope you enjoyed the class this evening, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. God bless.